South African actors are calling on President Cyril Ramaphosa to sign the Performance Protection Amendment Bill into law. Actress Vatis Wandacha penned an open letter to the Arts and Culture Minister where she highlighted issues including exploitation, poor remuneration, intimidation and unfair treatment. Well, Ndaka joins us with Karlin Deval Smith from the South African Guild of Actors and entertainment lawyer Unati Malunga. Good evening to all of you. Thanks very much um, for coming through. Vatis Wandaka, an extraordinary move. What prompted it? I was just tired. Um, I was tired of us letting the system drain us and accept and legitimize exploitation. So it was time for somebody to say something, and that person just had to be me. And I was willing to take that step. It wasn't easy. I mean, I had a whole lot of conversations, even with my brother, you know, that you do know what this means. And by the time I, I sent the letter, I had made peace with what could come with me sending out the letter to the minister. Well, there are reports today that uh, uh, Ferguson Films um, may just sue you. Does it bother you or worry you? Um, I don't know about it. it. It doesn't bother me. I mean, I think I'm so ready for whatever comes. Um, I'll deal with it. I mean, no one has spoken to me officially about that, so I don't know. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll deal with that when it happens. Yeah. Karlin, you, as the guild of actors, you've been seized with these matters <laughs> for a while. I mean, uh, recently you, you made representation, well, months ago, I should yes. say, um, in Parliament and speaking to these issues. How widespread are the issues Vatiswa uh, is raising, uh, I mean, in the industry? I think, unfortunately... Fatiswa speaks to a portion of something that is systemic. Mm. It is everywhere. It is in audiovisual, it is in theater, it is in performers, no matter where they are in, in what productions they are in. I think there's exploitation that happens. There are working conditions that are not satisfactory. Um, there is this power struggle between, you know, the, the producers, the broadcasters, or the producers, the, the financiers, you know, and, and the actors are at the very kind of end of the food chain. So, you know, everything trickles down to the actor. And the weird thing for me is the actors are on screen. They're the ones who make your program. They're the ones who get the ratings, you know. So ultimately, it doesn't make sense to me that there isn't that kind of mutual respect that says you are valid to this production and we understand that we are valid in producing it or in broadcasting it. And... And the people are not sitting at the, same, at the same table. And I think, to a large extent, the exploitation will continue until people realize that we are all part of a very, very important value chain. But ultimately, that actors need to be able to have a voice. And the South African Guild of Actors is the only organization for actors that can speak on behalf of actors. Unazi well, and... Uh this is all this is done mostly in the form of a contract yes. you know and uh, i saw a lot of people raising uh, that issue saying look a contract is something entered to between yes. two parties and uh, it's up to the one party to accept or reject uh, the contract yes. that is true and that reflects the 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 reality as it is and ultimately, it is a power play. I think she used the word power play because um, if you don't have leverage to negotiate a better deal, then you are at the mercy of the other party, the other contractual party. Um, I do think it's a systemic issue. I also think that it, 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 the whole value chain of this industry needs to be looked at because they kinks in every, every point along the value chain. So, yes, it is a contractual issue, and that is why I think the collective activity of a guild um, is where that can really shift the power balance. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but what makes these actors particularly vulnerable? Because they don't have a voice. Mm. They, they, don't have <clears throat> they don't have a voice. They know what could happen. I mean, 
if, an, if a producer is going to tell you that there's someone else who can take this money that you don't want, or mm. if you can't work in this environment, there are other people who want the job, mm. what are you going to do? So actors, I think we, we write down there at the bottom of the value chain. Mm. And that's why people can do as they please with us. I picked up um, from, from what you were saying earlier that you, you, you also kind of almost feel like you were party to this exploitation, yeah. almost like you invited it or at the very least allow it to hap allowed it to happen uh, for so long. I did for the longest time um, because you are thinking, um, I talk of home affairs and home affairs, I was really not that well known. And I walked away with 9,000 rand for the entire series. And you think it's going to get better, and you keep on allowing it to happen. And so I think for me, I'm so upset with myself because I knew back then that there's something wrong with this. But I just carried on because I did not want to rock the boat. In your engagements, Colleen, with... Uh the industry what have the conversations been like are there issues that perhaps production companies um sort of raise to say we wish we could do what you're asking us to do but we can't for whatever reason in fact are those conversations even taking place maybe you know i think i think the interesting thing is that in some in some circles there are amazing conversations that are happening you know through the uh, forum of sasfed the south african screen federation you know, actors are, are sitting opposite producers all the time and going, you know, what is fair, what isn't fair, where are their concerns, where are their issues, where are actors' issues. And the problem, again, though, is the systemic nature of it. So, you know, producers are at the whim of either the financiers or the broadcasters. So they are also sitting within a box. So we say to them, listen here, the producers have to do A, B, and C. The difficulty is we don't know what that is and what what they have available and then they go it's the broadcaster mm -hmm. the fascinating thing is we also sit at the broadcaster so mm -hmm. we we're trying to have conversations with everybody and the broadcaster pleads poverty mm -hmm. so the problem is that you have to put content on screen and they will do it at whatever cost and it was a number of years ago where I actually realized that the, pro the productions that were happening were X amount per minute and 10 years later, they were half they of half. that. But they were trying to produce the same quality programming, but for half the price. And the problem is that actors are being paid less now than what they were paid then. And also, there is no kind of standard. There's no regulation in the industry. And yes, we want to self-regulate, but we want people to be able to say that these are the areas and the issues. These are the things we need to deal with. It is systemic. But it is about labor. We don't have rights. We don't fall under the Labor Relations Act. We are freelancers. We are independent contractors. We don't have rights. And unless we, unless we can sort out these issues that are so intrinsic that affect the contracts mm -hmm. as well, and that's why we sit in this situation. How do we know what's true, Colin? Because I think the good thing is that you have access to these people. Mm. How do we know they're telling us the truth? Because I, I speak to um, people in, in, from, from the channels and I ask them, how is it that you keep on offering less budgets? And they say, no, that's, that's impossible. We would never do that. And that's the problem, is that yeah. we don't know. We don't know. And as, I mean, recently I, I was sitting with a producer negotiating and they were like, well, this is my budget. Mm. And I was like, show me the budget. Let me see what you have available and what not. And this is one of the producers who is so hell-bent on making sure that every production is better than the, than the next one. But they also sit going, we can't give you, we can't give you royalties. Is this true even for like public entities like the SABC, for example? Well, I think the, the mention of uh, production costs being halved is true of, of some of the broadcasters. And I think it, 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 from the producer's point of view, it is a budgetary issue because now they've got to make the same content for less than the money. And any time we ask that something be done, for example, having safety officers on set 
or it, it becomes a budget issue. Yeah. So nothing then gets addressed, and this is why it has to be collectively dealt with on that level. It can't. It can no longer remain um, an individual contractual issue. Um, I remember I was part of a, an intellectual property task team when I was at a broadcaster some years ago, and we were trying to sort out these terms of trade. Um, but nothing happens thereafter. So we sat with producers, we sat with um, all the industry bodies, and we were working out terms of trade. But because there's no continuity, it's a stop start with everybody, with government, with the broadcasters. So the people who initiated then leave and nothing gets done. Mm -hmm. And that's the state of affairs. Uh, you have this uh, interesting story, I mean, that is about how you got to be part of Igazi in, in the first place. Right? You were based in the Eastern Cape at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Um, the show then did well, season one. Um, of Ikazi until there were these rumors of cash flow and related problems. And then all of a sudden, uh, budgets got tighter, even S&Ts were like mega amounts of 100 bucks or something um, like that. Now, I, I'm trying to understand here this reality that perhaps there is a reality that we may not be appreciating, and that is um, the tight sport, that is production companies get put in by the broadcasters and whoever else. But that's the thing we don't know. Mm. We don't know. So perhaps if they were to play open cards, yes. maybe you'd understand exactly. their problems that's even the even better. We, we, there's no transparency. Fortunately, she was my agent at the time <laughs> when I did season one. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I said to her, um, please let's give them two free calls. You know, because we're so excited about this. We're in this drama. together. Yes, um, the, everybody. And by season two, I mean, the attitudes had changed, and we, there was just no communication from the executive producers. We didn't have the great relationship that we had like in season one. And we don't know what caused that, because maybe we're asking for more money as a result of what we saw with season one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, Onati, you know, Keke Mputi, who started in two of, in two Ferguson um, productions, also shared on Twitter her own experiences. Right? She claims when she fell pregnant, the production company said she would still have her job. But at, as she was about to go away, um, she claims that she was told her contract had come to an end long before the scheduled uh, time. Can these production companies get away with stuff like that because what you say or promise should be binding i mean should be an agreement entered into between uh, the parties yes but if if the other party has no power they know that you're not going to challenge mm. that decision they know you're not going to go to a lawyer you're not going to take it to court so it is the wild wild west and this is why i'm saying every part of the value chain. Like for instance, I'm, I render professional services to the industry. If there was free legal advice available to the sector, subsidized maybe by um, government or something like that, a resource for the sector, then we wouldn't be having these problems because then people would be getting legal advice. So that's, these are the kind of issues that make actors vulnerable. I think um, also, you know, Saga, for example, because we're membership driven, yes, yeah. we do have part of that money does go to legal resource. Mm. The difficulty, though, is what legal resource? Mm. Because we don't fall under labor. So we can't take people to the CCMA, which now, are the mechanisms that are there for that. Does the Performance Protection Amendment Bill deal with the issues we're talking about here tonight? Um, I don't think it specifically deals with the contractual issues, I think it deals with the rights. So actors will be able to earn remuneration for the usage of their work on all the platforms, whether it be broadcast or internet. Um, you know, it's in line with, I think Florence was saying in the previous segment with the Beijing Treaty. But more so, these issues are contractual issues. Mm -hmm. These issues are also around the status of the actor. The actor being a freelancer versus the actor being an employee. If we 
cannot d decide and determine what the terms are under which actors are contracted. If you are an employee, things work in one way. If you are a, you know, an independent business, it works another way. But we're, we're kind of stuck in this gray area in the middle, and nobody is, is coming on board to say, how do, we, how do we address this? How do we say, actors need to be seen as this? They are professionals. They, they've studied. They do this for a living. This isn't something that they do because they wake up and they go, oh, I want to be an actor. Actors are drawn to this, so we need to be able to protect them and find where they fit. Unless we have that, contracts really are, are going to be one-sided. Well, that's, I mean, how do other jurisdictions deal with these uh, sorts of issues? I saw, I mean, in the tweets and the conversations that people have yeah. been having on social media, there are those unfair comparisons that don't help the conversation. Because yes. if you say uh, an actor in the United States gets so much for yes. per season, or, it's an unfair comparison. It's, yes. That's not going to take our conversations anywhere, unfortunately. But jurisdictions that have been more successful than us in dealing with these sorts of issues, what are the sort of things that they do? Or they well, done? the first thing is there has been a history of struggle in setting up in all those guilds. So in the US, there's SAG, um, you know, and in Britain, there's been a history of setting these up, a history of collective action. Um, secondly, what the guilds do there is that they set minimum floors. So they say, this is the minimum wage that you can uh, uh, earn on a commercial, um, earn on a soapy, earn on a, because you must remember there are also different kinds of, of content, right? Um, and if, if you're a member, these are the, and then the producers sign up to be members, they cannot use non-union members. And that's the crux. And they, um, have, they have that collective um, bargaining yes. to be able to do that. And yes. I think the interesting thing also that, that you mentioned here is, you know, the minimum rate guideline. And what's fascinating is that, you know, as the industry trying to self-regulate, um, you know, agents and, and they're basically the only line of defense that actors have in any kind of way is, is in, in negotiating. <laughs> Correct. And they could be for or they could be against you, unfortunately. Yeah. The, the fascinating thing for me, though, is in that Saga has been looking at trying to set some kind of minimums mm. so that you, you're not having these immoral offers mm. that are going out to actors. And then we are um, faced with a competition commission that oh, we can for setting, for setting for minimum setting. rates because we are not protected. So Saga may not publish the rates yeah. as minimums because of anti-competitive behavior. Yeah, yeah. We are stuck wherever we turn to with trying to self-regulate, we are stuck. Can oh. we not look at broadcasters then to solve the problem in the yes. meantime, whilst nothing big can happen? Broadcasters must oversee to it that we've given you this, do this and follow through. Let's see that our, because they all claim that we, we look out for the interests of everybody on set. What is it that they do actually mm. to prove that? Broadcasters can, and again, it's a value chain issue because you can't look at the leg between the producer and the actor without looking at the broadcaster and the producer, right? So broadcasters can actually require the chain of title documentation. They can require to see the actor contract that that producer has signed. They, have, they can do that. They can make sure that, that, um, that the budget that the producer has given them for a particular line item like a lead mm -hmm. actor ties up. You know, there, there is a certain amount of monitoring mm -hmm. that they can do. But they're not doing it, obviously. No. So uh, no, is no. it because there's perhaps, uh, shall we call it, an incestuous relationship <laughs> um, uh, between your broadcasters and production houses? Uh, it works for them. It might not work for actors, but um, the two of them may be happy that, you know, things are working out between well, them. I, I think the problem is that, you know, certain broadcasters do care um, and certain broadcasters don't. I mean, if you go to the SABC, they don't have any archive of anybody's contract. Um, if you go and try and claim for your repeat fees, you have to basically give them the contract. Surely they should have it in their archive because they're the ones responsible to have to pay repeat fees. They don't have any of that documentation. So it is systemic. Yeah. There's no, nobody in the value chain that, chain that is taking responsibility 
So when it comes to the actor, we just have to get on with it. We have to be on set, pitch up. I mean, there, there's no regulation when it comes to what happens with sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. Saga has been, been vocal with uh, Swift, the sisters working yeah. in film and television, around making sure that this gets addressed. But you look at the conditions on set even now. Odwa Shweni. And off, nobody off the goes to, to set to monitor. No. There, there, there's no one who, who says, let me go there and tick the boxes. Look, the national... That's the danger. The National Film and Video Foundation, I do know, are setting up a monitoring arm um, where they are going to be visiting sets. But, of okay. course, they're not going to be there all, all the, the time, time, every day. You know, but it's random checks, spots, um, making sure that conditions are, are okay. What we have discussed with Swift um, is a, a, a procedure because when you, when an, you as an actor, something happens to you on set, who do you go to report to? Mm -hmm. So that also needs to be sorted out in terms of sexual harassment. Let's just uh, uh, have a look at some of the tweets uh, that have come from some of uh, your colleagues, starting with uh, Florence Masebe, who says, we need uh, more fed up voices to call out the mess in the South African television industry. Thank you, Vatis Wandaka, for your bravery. We have to stand with you, all of us. Rami Chwene um, says that here lie the remains of Vatis Wandaka's acting career that died on the 7th of October 2019. Good luck at the Vatican as you pursue a career in engineering, teaching, or whatever. It's been real boo and a uh, bit of humor there. And a lot of people, I think, misinterpreted what uh, she was uh, trying to say. But Silo uh, Maigegan Mube says, Vatiswa, your pain reverberates in a debilitating throb in my soul. This is an echo of a thousand muted voices. I just pray and hope that it doesn't end as yet another agonized howl in the wilderness. I wish you could, I wish uh, could, could commend you for brave. This is when you can no longer suffer in silence. Your heart, your heart beats in mine. Kate Hodanke says, there are many truth that, truths that still need to surface about the blatant exploitation of artists in this country and the conditions under which they work. We assume South Africa is Hollywood. It is not. Artist stories will come out one by one. It is time. Only some, of course, of uh, the people who have numerous uh, South Africans and actors who have responded uh, to your uh, article. Where to from here? <laughs> we, <laughs> we just carry on with the dialogue. And I mean, the reason that I extended this letter to the minister is that I think he has the power to, to make something happen. You know, um, I could have gone to Saga to say to the guys, look, what can we do? But it needed someone who is in a position of power to look at it and say, okay, I think this is what needs to be done. And I think the conversation that is happening on social media will lead to that. Not mm -hmm. We also need to get all the relevant government departments in the room. Yeah. So for example, Department of Labor must be involved, SARS must be involved for the freelance exemption. Um, all the relevant departments, we need to actually sit down and work this out. Maybe a sectorial determination, we'd spoken about that earlier. Um, but these are long-standing issues. These are issues that have been there for a long time and something's got to give. And well done for, for breaking the silence. Thank you. Um, I think the conversation does need to, to carry on. And the one thing I think that, that we're missing out on is solidarity. You know, actors, when, when Vatiswa puts her life on the line like she just has, then suddenly everybody talks. But for the rest, nobody stands together. And unless we stand together as actors and stand together as an industry, our voices will not continue to be heard. People will silence, be silenced again because they want to work. They don't want to be blacklisted. They don't want to be seen as being difficult or vocal or saying things because everybody must toe the line. So I do think that actors need to, to stand together. And, you know, that's what Saga is about. We actors working for actors. Well, let's hope this is the beginning of uh, the end of uh, exploitation of artists and in this country. Vatis Wandaka, Karlin Deval-Smith and Unati Malunga, my guests this evening.
But Nightline returns. Mineral and Energy Minister Gwede Mandashe champions cleaner coal at the Windaba conference. More details when we come back. <laughs>